program over, over to the Director of Jewish National Fund Speaker Bureau, Sarah Cohen. Thank you, Dan, for the warm introduction. And thank you all for joining this evening to discuss the extraordinary journey through the history and land of Israel and the development of modern Israeli food with Joan and Stephen. It's an honor to introduce you to Stephen Shalowitz. Stephen is the host of Jewish National Fund's Israel Cast podcast. And for more than eight years, he has produced and hosted the One Way Ticket Show podcast, where he explores with fascinating people where they go, given a one way ticket, no coming back. He's also a JNF New York board member and on JNF social media committee and invites you to all connect with him on social media at Stephen Chalowitz. Ladies and gentlemen, it's now my privilege to introduce you to the Jewish world master chef. She is a renowned writer who is the author of 11 cookbooks, including her latest work, King Solomon's Table, a culinary exploration of Jewish cooking from across the world released in 2017. Her previous cookbook, Quiches, Kugels, and Couscous, My Search for Jewish Cooking in France, was named uh, one of the 10 best cookbooks of 2010 by NPR, Food and Wine, and Bon Appetit magazines, and Jewish Cooking in America, which earned the James Beard Award for the Best American Cookbook in 1994. She's a popular broadcaster who amassed a large following from her PBS television series, who is senior producer of Passover, Traditions of of Freedom, an award-winning documentary sponsored by Maryland Public Television, and who has appeared as a guest on numerous radio and television programs. And she is a passionate history buff who in 2011 was awarded a special recognition award from the, I'm gonna pronounce this wrong, so I'll just say it, YOVO Institute for her work to preserve Jewish food culture. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome a culinary superstar, Joe Nathan, Stephen and thank Stephen and Joan, thank you. I turn the program over to you. Thank you very much for that, Sarah. It's so great to be here. And Joan, it's absolutely an honor, truly, to speak with you and to have you join us uh, on our fall reading series for the month of November. Can't believe, but I think you're probably just as glad as we are that 2020 is indeed winding down. So once again, thanks for joining us, Joan. I have so many questions to get to you. To get to you. Uh, based on your book and based on really just your extraordinary career. And I really wanted to first start by asking you, what is your approach when you first start writing a cookbook? Well, what I do is, I, well, I can think of, I can tell you about this one. It's a perfect example. Please. I really didn't know what to write next. And then the day that Rabin died, I thought, I know what I have to do what next. I have to write a book on the foods of Israel. And I mean, I remember it so distinctly. I was actually speaking at a, a supermarket in Chicago and uh, taking them around what was kosher in a supermarket market. It was an Italian supermarket that had a big Jewish population. And uh, so, so I did that. And what I did, what I always do with my books is I take a file in the computer and I think about how I, how I want to stage the book and what I want to say. Um, I always write my introduction last of all, putting notes in a file, the introduction for months and months and months. And then I think about what I want. So in these different documents, there might be, let's say there's one on breads. So there are a lot of breads. And I also have a document about where I want to go. And I feel as if 10 days of the way I travel is enough each time. I, you know, I, I, most of my, these books have been done when I have kids. I have a, I had a husband. Um, I, I, I go very intensely when I'm traveling. So I think I have to go back and go back home. So I don't know if I'm making any sense. So I, look at my computer and let's say I'm going to Israel. I would spend one whole trip up north and I'd be gathering things that would go in breads, fish, because I think that people like to, except for the book I'm writing now, I'm not doing it this way, but that they basically want the, the, whatever I'm going to write as a cookbook. Therefore, it, the things should be done 
because it could be a history book, this book. Well, this book, yeah, it's a wonderful history book. And I want to get to some of the anecdotes, actually, that you included in the book uh, in just a short while. And then what's that culling process for you like uh, when it comes to the actual recipes themselves? Do you say, this is too potchki, I'm not going to make this one or include this one. This is something everybody can make. How do you draw that distinction, Joan? A lot of different distinctions. Um, first of all, if I don't like it, if I don't want to make it again, I don't want it in my book. Um, that's number one. Um, that, that's really, and also it has to have a story behind it. If, if they don't, go, there's no story, nothing, you know, people don't want to read. You want to keep your writer, your reader turning the pages. Yeah, and you've made it very personal with the stories from the people that um, the recipes came from. And that's really one of the beautiful things, things about, about this book. Um, I'm gonna hopscotch around a little bit, but I think that it's also worthwhile, Joan, when we talk about Israel, talking about, of course, this uh, Zoom series, this reading series is being powered by Jewish National Fund. And before we dive even into the book, I want you to share a little bit about your own personal JNF story. Well, my father was a German Jew. He came over in 1929. And there were two things he was interested in. They were, and, and I think part of this was because of the, he was involved in something called uh, uh, the, the, black, the white and the blue, or blue, yeah, white and blue. And it was a Zionist youth group. And he felt even before he ever went to Israel that the Jewish National Fund was, for him the most important. And the, the other one was uh, the Technion. Those two he felt were really important. And he was you know, on the board of trustees for many, many years for the Jewish National Fund. So that's what he, you know, he didn't, yeah, that's what he was really interested in. So I grew up, of course, with the little blue box. The box, right. And also, you know, grew up with the stories of the trees and everything. And, you know, and the first time I went to Israel, that's just where I went to. And, and in, in fact, even when my children had my, I forget which, well, two of my children had their barn bat mitzvahs, instead of, I, 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 instead of getting all kinds of tchotchkes for everybody at the party they had, we, we, we gave each person a tree in Israel. So a lot of their friends weren't Jewish, but they were very proud that they had this tree in their name in Israel. And that's what we did. That's beautiful. And so everything's kind of come full circle here. Well, listen, speaking of Israel, there's a beautiful quote that you had in the book, one of many quotes, and it reads like this. Someone once told me that even if you don't live in Israel, Israel can teach you how to live. Yeah. So I'm wondering, how has, how has Israel taught you how to live, Joan? Well, I lived in Israel for almost three years working for Teddy Kollek, the mayor of Jerusalem. And at the end of that period or a year after I came back was the 73 war. And a lot of young people that I knew were killed. Hmm. And, you know, before I, when I knew them, I, you know, I realized that they lived every day. And that's what people in Israel do. And they sort of know what's important and they have the guts to try what's important. And I think that, you know, since I've come back from Israel, um, I, you know, I feel the same way. I, I, I want to explore every part of life and I'm not afraid to do that. I mean, right. a lot and I, and I can see people over and over saying to me, you know, be careful, be careful. But I just go straight ahead. And I, I think, yeah, and, and it teaches you what's important. Right. Life I'm glad you brought this. Life is so precious, you said. Indeed. I'm glad you brought up Teddy Kolak because on a little bit of a lighter note, if you will, um, yeah. you write in the book that he was a self-proclaimed gourmand. And I thought that was actually rather interesting because the years that he was mayor was 1965 to 1993. And Israel wasn't exactly a culinary destination at that time. But then you also wrote about the fact that he used to 
engage with people in their homes and used to be fed. So I'm wondering where did that self-proclaimed gourmand in Teddy Kolak, where did that come from? Because I know he was born in Vienna, excuse me, he was born in Budapest and then grew up in Vienna. So did it come from that or did it come from his uh, being entertained in his constituents' homes? Well, I think for Teddy, it was more, first of all, he was born in Prague. Wasn't oh, he was born in Prague, I'm sorry. I thought he was born in, in, uh, but he, in Budapest. No, but he sort of, anyway. No, yeah. it, was, it was all the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Thank you for clarifying. But he was kind of sophisticated. Um, I mean, even though he was a kibbutznik, he had the sophistication of the world and had spent a lot of time in the States for the Haganah and other things and had met like, I don't know, Marlene Dietrich and all these women. But so that he ate with them, he wasn't like a kibbutznik that would go, you know, he, he, there was more, maybe it's because he was from Central Europe, but there was more of a sophistication in, in his, and he liked to eat. But I, I think it, it, the gourmand is the correct word, not gourmet. No, a liked, gourmand, yes. Like yes. he liked to eat. He wasn't necessarily the most discriminating. But you know, like his wife made terrific cookies, these little uh, little crescent butter cookies with almonds that you know that are sort of like uh, oh, Eastern Middle Eastern um, gourabia or the Mexican uh, wedding cookies. You know, they're like butter cookies, like corumbiatas. He he would eat that kind of cookie. Do you have her recipe, by the way? I have it in the in the flavor of in this. In the well, in the flavor of Jerusalem and also in the foods of Israel. Oh, in the foods of Israel. I'm just saying. Um, I want to go to some of what you've written about in the book here. And again, you have such wonderful stories, and one of which is about the tomato and the Eliezer Ben Yehuda story about tomatoes. And for our wonderful Zoom members that are joining us that might have the book, that's on page 160. 160. And I'm wondering if you can share that story. And again, this is one of the things I love about this book. It's not only uh, recipes and there's just, you know, chock full of delicious ones, but also you have these wonderful anecdotes. And if you'd share that with us, I'd love it. Oh, let me just think. Well, um, first of all, uh, Eliezer Ben Yehuda was the father of modern Hebrew. Right. And whenever it was, it, it, there was a new word, he would introduce it to his family and to the public and everybody had to use the word. So um, that, that he, he would, let me just think. <laughs> sure, go ahead. So it was also called the love apple. Mm -hmm. And um, that was introduced to Palestine in the 18th century. And then the common word was, word was agvaniya, from a Hebrew root that means to love sensuously. And Ben, ben Yehuda didn't like the word agvanit, the plural, he felt it was too sexually suggested. So he turned to colloquial Arabic as he often did and coined the word badura. But after he announced the word in his newspaper column, his soldiers received their marching orders from then on. Whenever any member of the Ben Yehuda family went into a shop to purchase a tomato, he or she was to ask for a badura. And if the shopkeeper didn't know what Badur meant, the family member would point to the tomato. Although this way of introducing new words into modern Hebrew usually worked, the public didn't take to the word Badura, preferring the more sensual word Agvania. After a few years, the only people who used that word were members of the Ben Yehuda family, including Mrs. Whitman, now in her 90s, who shared this story with me. So that that's you know that's what it was and i uh, love that i love that story you know because language and food uh, go go hand in hand don't they well and 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 he and eliezer ben yehuda really had a very strong influence on food in the language and this is i mean this one he wasn't very successful with <laughs> you know he would go and look at like um the word sufganiya were but coming to hanukkah so he thought Sufgan is like a sponge, Sufgan, a sponge mm -hmm. uh, in, in Greek. And of course, Greek was the first donut. 
And so um, I forget what they call it in, in Greece, but anyway, um, so he, he wanted to use that. And that's how he got the word Sufganiya because Sufganiyot or Sufganiya was really the, uh, uh, the newest foods. It was an, a strictly Israeli custom, like, you know, latkes was Eastern European. They wanted something for everybody. And that's what they, they did. And they used the words of Kanya. You've met such extraordinary people all over the world, Joan, including in Israel. And I was actually um, quite heartened to see that you met Natan Sharansky's mother. Oh yeah. And, and you retell that story on page 275 of, of the book. And there was something that she said, which I thought was really quite powerful for me. Um, and I am going to try and find it right here. And she said, quote, when, when she was living in Odessa, she said, in my apartment, the door was closed so I could cook what I wanted. Who knew what was Jewish and what was Russian? In other words, food was so personal for her and she could express her identity through food. And I'm wondering if you can talk about perhaps you're remembering meeting Mr. Sharansky, Natan Sharansky's mother, and then also this notion of food as being um, a really a personal expression. Well, I met, actually, it's a funny story. And you met him as well. Yeah, he and I were on the same plane one day with a, 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 another friend of mine from Jerusalem. And my friend introduced me to him and I told him that I've been trying to interview his mother for this book for a long work time because I'd heard she was a really good cook and I couldn't get through and he got through to, for me so I got to interview her but she was known as a good cook and she lived in Katamon in one of these old houses in, in part of Jerusalem and um uh, you know, and I had a, I, I, she didn't speak any English, so I had a, um, a translator with me, but she was very, very, really a very nice woman, and um, I, she, she, you know, the thing is that during the Soviet period, it was very hard to make food other than what they wanted you to make. And, you know, and, and also you didn't want to be so um, bourgeois as to like food because it was a different period. So, um, and she was a, 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 a child during the Russian Revolution because she was born 1908. So she's a little bit, three years younger than my father. And um, I don't know, she, you know, she, things like challah weren't known then bagels weren't known then and bagels were totally different in Russia by the way than they were in Poland um, they do, they weren't boiled and baked they were just baked mm -hmm. but they were rolls with a hole um, and and she would prepare recipes that had been handed down orally from her mother so she didn't have any cookbooks and you know it's it, she made her own cottage cheese which she hung in a net mm -hmm. um, and she used a, she, she, she snuck in matzah mm -hmm. after Stalin. So you could get killed for doing something like that. Yeah. And uh, anyway, so that's really what. How did, you, how did you happen to know or who told you that, that she was a good cook, by the way? I mean, because it's not one of the first things that you think about when you think about Natan Sharansky. You think of him and his struggle, not that his mother was a great cook. I might have read it in one of his in his book. Right. Um, I, I you know the thing is that to write books the way I do, you have to have a lot of people that are giving you information. Mm -hmm. And I did my best friend at the time when I well this was later, but I knew a lot of Sovietologists because mm -hmm. it's a whole different ball game, you know, and. I guess some, or else somebody in the government, I can't, honestly, with this one, very often I know who, how I got to somebody, but Ema Sharansky, I can't remember how I got to her. Interesting. Now, when we talk about bread, you were just mentioning breads, right? Matzah and breads and so on. Um, can you talk about just the overall importance of bread in Israeli cuisine and this whole notion of baking bread? And there, there's something else I'm going to add on to that, Joan, and just sort of let you fly with this whole bread theme. Yeah. 
Um, when I read in your recent interview in the Jerusalem Post, you talked about stones that you bring back that you bake bread on. Can you also talk about that and how that works? Oh, well, first of all, bread is so basic for everybody and especially for poor people throughout the world. And, you know, starting with the Sabbath, uh, for, you know, for centuries, people would have dark bread during the week and they'd have white bread for the Sabbath. And that was something special, right? So that whatever you made for the Sabbath had to be special. Now in Israel, um, the government would give a, a subsidy to uh, give out free challah on Friday. I, I, I might be wrong if it's a subsidy or they gave it out for free. And, but they were, you know, twisted challah rather than like if you were um, a Yemenite, you would have wanted a flat challah. Or if you were a Moroccan, you would have had anise in your challah. So the different people had different things, but these were the two, I mean, the one, they only did, gave the, the um, twisted challah. So everybody would take it, but they would also have their flat challah if they believed in it, or the um, Ethiopians would have a, do, a dobos, which was a round hala, um, you know, just different things. And, um, you know, it was just so cheap and important. And, you know, when you see, I mean, I'm at right now in LA and there's so many kinds of filled breads with hala. And there, in this book, there's, um, I don't know what page it is or anything. There's a recipe for a triangular bread dough filled with greens that are growing by the wayside and it was and it was actually it was a Bedouin I think and I went to her home and I she was gathering all these greens to make bread to put as the stuffing and I realized that again people use bread not only to say prayers over or to use just to eat but to stretch food to make a meal and you know and then I come back to the United States and I'll see like um, a more sophisticated bre triangular bread, let's say a le in a Lebanese bakery with greens in it, most likely spinach. And what happens to me is I'm drawn back to the way these women made it, first gathering the greens, um, making them in their breads and cooking on very makeshift ovens, you know, so, so that were, um, with wood, but they're almost tin ovens. And then what about that black stone? Oh, the black stone, good. I'm glad you're there because I keep forgetting things. Okay, a black stone, when I was in um, on a trip to Israel once, I um, went with this, um, I, I, I visited a place near Galilee, or I don't even know where it was. Somebody took me way out in the fields to some place. And they had their bread on black stones. And I asked where they got them. And they said they're all along the Sea of Galilee on the coast. And I was there with my ed editor, Judith Jones, the Bron Judith Jones, who was Julia Child's editor, and she was in the movie Julie and Julia as the mean editor. You know, she, right. she liked the mean editor. But anyway, I brought her with me to Israel, and the two of us had had bread on it so that would have these little um, undulations in the, the bread. It was very pretty. So we were determined not only to get the stones, which we did, and bring them back. But we also got a, a Kubana, um, you know, a Kubana mold that you made the bread, the, the Yemenite bread, that's overnight bread that rises and is heaven, one of the most delicious dish things I've ever eaten in my life. And you put on top of it um, eggs to, to bake and you put it in the oven for uh, at least nine hours. And it starts small and it gets bigger and bigger, and bigger. You could put those stones in; it would be really nice too. But we so we got the we got the Kubana um, molds. We got the stones that we put in the molds to bring them here, and then we got a huge bread uh, um, thing to you know, like a breadboard to put the bread in the oven. I 
I can't remember, some baker gave two of us, the, uh, two of them to us. I don't remember who it is, but I know it's in my house. <laughs> How great is that? We have some questions actually from our audience and I'm gonna to get to them in just a second, but I, you can't speak about bread without speaking about soup, right? And you, you, in the book, you said that there are probably more kinds of soup in Israel than in any other country. And I don't have a, a particular question about soups other than what is it that you love about soups? Do you have a favorite soup to prepare? And what advice do you have for people? I was gonna say, I don't have any questions, but I'm giving you three questions right now as I start talking, Joan. But um, how do you, because um, I've spoken to chefs before, both uh, for both podcasts I do, and we do often talk about soups and talk about you can have a really simple soup, but you can really jazz it up. And right. so talk to us about the importance of soups and how you can jazz up even a very simple basic soup. Well, first of all, I think that there are more soups in Israel than almost any place in the world because there are more Jews from different countries than most places in the world. That, that answers the other question. That question, yeah. Um, uh, also, uh, uh, soup is something that feels good. It's a way of stretching food again, especially in the winter, soups are really nice. Although I love cold soup in the summer too. Um, and there are so many delicious kinds of soups that are like a Yemenite chicken soup. There's nothing better in the world. And then I now I make it with matzo balls in it, tiny little matzo balls but it's got cilantro, it's got parsley, it's got dill. Um, it's so it's got, very healthy, if nothing else. Healthy, yeah. Persian soups have similar things in them. They're really good. Um, I, I love a good borscht, tomatoes, you know, a, a beet soup. Um, and I love the kuba soups of the Kurdish Jews who were considered always second-class citizens in Israel. And their food was just divine. You know, these little um, Kurdish dumplings are, um, and they're made of a semolina or um, bulgur or burgo, whichever you call it. And then you stuff them with meat and then you cook them in either a tomato broth or a, or a pumpkin broth or an Aramaic parsley and lemon broth. And they're just divine really divine and you find them i've found them in a lot of um you know find them in homes of course if you get to go into different communities but you find them like in jerusalem in a place called Mordur, or i forget the others but i that's the place i personally like to go right um we could have a whole conversation just on soups, by the way. I wanna to get to some of the questions from uh, those of uh, those attending this evening. And the first one uh, comes from Kathy Sider. Thanks for this, Kathy. What led you to write cookbooks? Well, I was working for Teddy Kollek in Jerusalem and um, I noticed that there were so many different people in, this, in, in Jerusalem. And I wanted, I also knew that um, food was a way to connect people. And I thought everybody thinks that things are, are have to be, um, let me just think, that, that, that everything, well, that we wanted to write, I wanted to write about food and people. And I just had this crazy idea of writing a cookbook on the food and the people of Jerusalem and that food broke down barriers between people. And I just noticed the way that the people were and that you could write a book. I, this is how I wrote my first cookbook, The Flavor of Jerusalem. And I wrote about all the different communities, Jews, Christians, and Muslim that made the mosaic of Jerusalem work. And you know, it sold 25,000 copies. So Not too bad for then, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, another question uh, came in from uh, Cindy. Hi, Cindy. She wanted to know if all the recipes are kosher. Uh, yes, they are. Right. And there's no, you know, chazer. There's no pork in here anyway. Um, another question from Nina Sabir. Thank you. I'd like to make lentil or split pea soups in the winter. Other bean soups too. Secret ingredient for bean soup add a dash of nutmeg. A little advice there oh, from Nina to add some nutmeg. It, it gives it a nice flavor. 
They are. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. Yeah. I'll try that the next time. I actually, I have a lot of, but black beans here. Um, and I do have regular bean soup, but you know, bean soups, it, what's so interesting is like my grandchildren love anything to do with beans because they have um, like nannies that are from El Salvador or someplace like that. And they love beans and rice. And I was trying to give them chicken or something else the other day. My three-year-old said to me, Aviv, he said, Grandma, we, we like beans and rice, you know? So, so I make them bean soup and bean soup is wonderful. And every Jewish community has their own version of bean soup, which is it's really- so, It's so funny, Joan, you said about black beans because um, about an hour before our call or an hour and a half before our call, I boiled up a whole pot of black beans and I, I have it for several days and I mix it with quinoa or like I did tonight with a, what I did was I made it sweet. So I mixed it in together with sweet potato, cinnamon, walnuts and sunflower seeds. Good. So, and you can put a little coconut oil in it, you know, as well. Um, I wanna ask you about, um, when, when you were first in Israel um, and the food situation was what it was, right? Did you ever think though, Joan, that we get to the point where it is today? No, never, never. I mean, I knew I liked it, but who was even thinking about food then? You know, they, I mean, I was doing whatever I was doing. You know, I didn't know where I was going. I was just doing and I was tasting and I loved all this unusual food. And then I wrote it about it in my cookbooks, my, the flavor juice in 1975. Um, and then the Jewish holiday kitchen, loads of Israeli recipes in that. And even in the um, Jewish cooking in America, lots of Israeli recipes, because I had been living there for three years and I really loved a lot of the food. Right. Um, but I never thought it would be, get the celebrity status that it has today. And I, I think it was the right time. I also think that food trumps huh, um, politics. And that that's why, I mean, people that really dislike Israel, what they're doing, let's say in the West Bank, um, still love Israeli food. And it, it's like, there's a disconnect. Right. Years ago, years ago, Joan, when I was doing my radio show in Singapore, I interviewed Anthony Bourdain and I asked him, what was the vibe? Pardon me? He was Jewish. Yeah, his mom and his, his mother, is it his grandmother, I think? His grandmother, right? Mother. His mother was, his mother was, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, then his grandmother too, but his mother was. And um, I asked him, what was the vilest thing you've ever eaten? What did he say? And his aunt, his answer was chicken McNuggets. <laughs> okay, so in the spirit of keeping it positive, if you wanna offer the vilest thing you've ever eaten, I'd be more than glad to hear that. But I'd like to know, what was the most memorable thing that you've ever eaten in Israel? Oh, well, um, I've already said this to somebody else, but I, I there's a, 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 actually a Palestinian dish called musachan that I love more than any other chicken dish in the world. It's chicken and uh, lots of onions and pine nuts and sumac and spices and a huge pizza bread. It's really delicious. Um, I, I also loved the foie gras that you could eat on a grill. It's, it's hard to get that anymore, but that was good when they were, um, they were processing um, geese. Um, I like that a lot. Let's think. There's just so many things. There's so many, right. Like I say, I want to ask you about the vial. That you can tell me uh, off air. You can tell me that separately. Um, but when you talk about fo foie gras, I'm, as, we meant, as we spoke about in our previous conversation, I'm plant-based now and for the last couple of years. And I know you said that your kids are more and more plant-based. So just in broad brush strokes, how do you approach then um, your cooking for the family and uh, for those people that are plant-based? Well, I, I do, um, it makes me think about that big kosher jerky in my freezer. And I thought, what did you get this for? That was so stupid this year. There are only six of us and most of them don't even eat meat. But anyway, 
Um, <laughs> I think I'll give it to the homeless. I don't know. But um, well, what I do is I do, I, I love to use lots of vegetables. And so I'm just using a lot more vegetables. You know, it's not hard for me to mm. change recipes. If you have chicken broth in it, use vegetable broth for soup, for example, because we eat lots of soups and we eat lots of vegetables. And um, yeah, I, and I use a lot of chickpeas. I mean, I was thinking yesterday how many chickpeas I had just yesterday. I had talk about the most vile um, falafel that I've ever had. I, I had it yesterday. And then I had, um, I, what I like to do is, first of all, I like to, um, to soak my own beans and buy, get the beans dry for, for falafel. And what I do now, and for hummus, I, I make my, I make like use four cups of, of beans, of chickpeas in hummus each time because it's in one of my cookbooks. And I throw in a preserved lemon, but then at the end, what I do is I cook the, be the other beans, the, the rest of the beans that are, that are cooked, I just put them on a sheet pan and put a little bit of olive oil and some salt and pepper and some hot pepper. Mm. And I roast them for about 40 minutes in about a 400 degree oven. And they're really hard and they're just wonderful. Really, really good. That sounds fantastic. So, so you're gonna get protein and it's the oldest protein known to mankind. I mean, it's amazing. and and. I mean, chickpeas are for sure the food of the future. They need very little water, um, and and they're and they're also the 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 food of the past. Right, it's a bridge to the past, indeed. We have another question. Um, let's see, we have two more questions here. That I'm, jo Joan, are you okay for time for a few more minutes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I am okay. Good, good. thank you. Um, this one comes from my friend, Saul. Hi, Saul, thanks for joining us. He says, thinking about NYC and noting that New York City is the largest Jewish city outside of Israel, um, what does Joan think, why does Joan think that Israeli food cuisine and all its forms, uh, fast food and more formal has not developed to become as ubiquitous in the city as for example, Chinese food? Of course we do have some, but nowhere near the accessibility that we have for East Asian cuisines and others. Well, first of all, cheap immigrant food comes with immigrants that need to feed families, and they are the ones who start restaurants. Israelis are starting them as a, they're not the same kind of immigrants as a lot of the Chinese are that are coming in. Um, that's number one. Number two, um, I, th I think, I think that's also number one and number two, because there would be more. And, and I think that the, uh, the numbers of Israelis compared to the numbers of Chinese or Asian are just not, they're astronomical. You know, they're very small compared to what they, the, the others are. So um, it used to be uh, when I would go around the country to speak, that you'd find this sort of dingy, dirty, Israeli kosher restaurant within ethnic communities. That the kind of place you would never want to go to, but it was kosher. And you, I, I remember going to one, and and I would always ask where there's a kosher restaurant, and you'd find them. And these were people that really were poor that needed to make it make a dollar, and th they were not appetizing restaurants at all. Although the way that they would make eggplant salads, um, uh, the way they'd make their meats were really tasty. Again, poor people food. Um, but, and they never amounted to anything. And, and the only kind of um, like restaurants in certain communities like the Lubavitcher were all pizza joints you know, that were dairy pizza joints. And there weren't any regular restaurants. Now there are, but there weren't. Right. Could, be, could, could be stay tuned. Uh, one more question from the field. 
Uh, let's see, this is, do you have any recommendations about using gluten-free flour or products in your recipes? Does it work to make blintzes, puff pancakes, and noodle kugel recipes from your book? Oh, you mean with, with just gluten-free gluten flour? I, you know, I, I have my own feelings about gluten-free. I think that, first of all, if you use sourdough bread, um, you're going to use better quality flour and you're going to use, there's more water per pound of bread in um, sourdough than in regular bread. Therefore, it's, it's better for you to use that. And there's, I would be willing to bet there, you know, unless you're a celiac, that there's less gluten that you're using gluten and that you won't have the same effects um, from these these kinds of grains. That's number one. Number two, um, the, 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 I mean, there are lots of, you know, there are lots of flourless chocolate cakes. There are lots of ways of using almond nuts. Um, I, you know, I just think that people should use less bread. We're such a bread bake based uh, country, but with huge bagels rather than small bagels, and that we're eating all this bread, you don't really have to. You, you know, you, you can eat so many more vegetables and rices and different things like that. Forget eating the bread, and I'll bet that you're not going to have as much of, um, uh, what do you call it? You know, you'll, you'll be able to eat more bread that way. You'll be able right. to eat if you eat less bread, you're going to be able to eat bread. Right. That's Joan, as we begin to wind down, you know, the other day I was on a Zoom call with two old friends from fourth grade. I went to Solomon Schachter in suburban Chicago, and um, I had mentioned to both of them that I was going to be speaking with Joan Nathan this evening and in, in our conversation. And um, one of them said, her name's Eileen, she said, Stephen, wait a minute. She left the call, she came back with two of your cookbooks, one of which was Jewish Cooking in America. And she said, look, the brisket recipe page is falling out and the open face peach tart recipe is also falling out because she bakes it and she makes the brisket so much. And it really got me thinking, Joan, about you and your career. You're sort of like Elijah, you're at everybody's table. And I'm just wondering, what's that like for you to know that your work is enjoyed by just countless people through the holidays on Shabbat and even just during the re regular weekday? Well, you know, it makes me feel good. I mean, <laughs> I still have to do everything everybody else has to do. I've just been really lucky that I've had the kind of career at the right moment. Um, you know, people weren't doing that. People, you know, you, you never thought of anything to do with Jewish cookbooks when you read um, the people I looked up to, Barbara Kafka, um, Julia Child, uh, um, just some, um, Marcella Hazan. These were women that were just that much older than me that were doing this. And, um, you know, I, I don't know, it's, it's just happened. It's, and it's really nice. Um, it's, it's been nice. I mean, I just actually was reading, I guess the Chicago Eater, and there was they were describing a new restaurant. I don't know how I got it. My brother sent it to me, but he lives in Rhode Island. I don't know why he sent it to me, but anyway. And it said that this this new um, deli is opening, and they're sort of reinventing the wheel. And the woman said, "But she's no Joan Nathan." And I thought. <laughs> And I, I wrote to her and I said, thank you, you made my day. And she said, oh my gosh, you know, you responded to me, but I don't, I don't realize any of that. What a compliment. Well, once again, the book is The Foods of Israel Today. It was our book that we uh, talked a little bit about today. We talked a little bit about everything because of course, when Joe Nathan is in the house, there's so much to talk about. And tell us about your next book. Well, it's a memoir. It's right. A memoir. It won't be out for two years, so you'll hear about it. But I just want to say one thing about JNF, you know, they're really, it's certainly in Western Galilee, they're really right now looking out to 
realizing the importance of food, number one. Number two, they're going to different traditions and trying to get recipes from all of these different traditions, from the Druze, um, from different Arabs, from Jews, from different cultures. Um, of this wonderful, you would love this woman. She's a plant-based uh, farmer right near Rosh Pina. And you know, I went to visit her to see what she was doing. And they're encouraging people to know about the diversity of, of the food of Israel. I mean, <laughs> the foods of Israel. Yeah, but, the food of Israel. You know, they, they're really spreading out and it's quite wonderful. And they're trying to keep the, the cultures, not just Jewish cultures, Arab cultures too. And the people really appreciate it with their, their working with. Anyway, that's, yeah. it's not a plug, it's just a fact. And it's an exciting time to be in Israel today, isn't it? I'm just generally speaking, and now you have this whole uh, new relationship with the Gulf countries, Sudan, Right. other other countries in the region i think from a food perspective it's just an extraordinary time to have those relationships isn't it well yeah and also you know that all the ethiopian i mean when i was there there were not there was there were ethiopians from the church and i and i spent a lot of time at that church and now um now that i visit ethiopia um uh, about two years ago but when I was in, in Israel last uh, two summers ago, there, you know, we went and the, we saw lots and lots of Ethiopians. And so Ethiopian food is becoming something. Sudanese food, because of all of the immigrants, not immigrant people that have come, come to work there, um, you know, even uh, Philippine food. Yeah, you get a bit of everything. Joan, this was so fantastic. We know you've stayed well after school for our conversation today, but really we'd look forward to having you back and chatting more, whether it's here on a Zoom call, it's on our podcast, Israel Cast, uh, or somewhere else. So uh, really let's stay in touch and really thank you so much. And before we actually head off, I just wanna say um, that our next, and maybe you can even join us, Joan, our next book club, we're taking December off uh, for all the Chagim, happy whatever people celebrate. Um, and we come back in January, and for Tubi Shvat, our feature book is called Eco Bible, an ecological commentary on Genesis and Exodus by Rabbi Yonatan Narrell. Can you see it? Rabbi, yeah. It's a bit shiny there. Rabbi Yonatan Narrell and Rabbi Leo D. And we actually had um, Rabbi Yonatan Narrell on our IsraelCast podcast talking about sustainability as it comes from the Torah. And it's absolutely fascinating. The book is doing extremely well right now on Amazon. It's just come out. And we're going to be doing this on January 27th, the day before Tu Bishva. Oh, How good. do you like that? So in any event, so we hope everybody can join us. Once again, a million thanks to you, Joan. Wishing you a happy Thanksgiving, a happy Hanukkah New Year, and stay healthy. Thank you so much. All right, over to you, Sarah. Great. Thank you, everyone, for joining tonight. Um, it was wonderful sitting with Joan and Stephen. It felt like two old friends. Uh, Stephen, thank you for the plug for the January uh, 27th of next year uh, with uh, Rabbi Yana Tanero. We appreciate, again, you, Joan, your time today. Um, and Stephen, of course, it was a pleasure, as always. Um, we look forward to seeing you in January. Thank you all. Take care. Take care.